Okay. So Stores Library is pleased to virtually host the American School for the Deaf 200 Years of History and Innovation. Jeff Braven and Jean Linderman will share with us the history of Sarah and Richard Stores from Longmeadow, a community of deaf students from Massachusetts who attended ASD and share some pertinent items from their archives. This presentation will be signed and feature an interpreter. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for this program. It's been co-sponsored by the Stores Library, the Longmeadow Historical Society, Longmeadow Adult Center is part of our Hidden Voices of History series. And this program is made possible through CARES Act funding to Federal Institute of Museum and Library Services as administered by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. So now I would like to introduce our two presenters. Jeff Braven has been employed at the American School for the Deaf since 2002 and is currently the executive director. He also presents nationally and internationally on issues related to deaf education. Jean Linderman has been working in the museum at the American School for the Deaf since 2013. She is currently the museum coordinator responsible for the preservation of the school's historical records and valuable documents. Jeff and Jean, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And I'm very much looking forward to talking with all of you this evening. Now, before we get started, I'll be sharing my screen. So I would like to ask if everybody could hide their videos so that if the interpreter needs to sign to me, it'll be easier for her to open up her video and I can identify her readily. Now, it's so nice to have this group here. And I do wanna take an opportunity to recognize Lars Holt, who is here with us this evening. He is the fourth great grandson of Lorraine Claire, who is one of our founding fathers for our school. So it is a pleasure and an honor to have you here this evening. And now I'll be sharing my screen. So the topic tonight is ASD and our 200 years of history. The school has been here such a long time and there's quite a bit of history and it. it's impossible for us to cover everything in one evening, but I'd like to highlight some of the import, important historical events and talk about our connection with stores. As I had an opportunity to talk with some people before the start of this session, I have to say I have not yet had an opportunity to get into the stores library and take a look around and so I am committed to doing so soon. But I know that several years ago as part of our bicentennial celebration, we had done a 200 mile bike tour of the state of Connecticut. And as part of that tour, we rode through different sites throughout our state that were associated with our history. And as part of that, I was able to bike through the stores area and past the library. We had some information about the history and the connection. And so I'm so pleased to be able to be with you all tonight to talk more about that. We also were involved with Longmeadow Day a few years ago. Jean Linderman was able to attend and it was a very nice event. So a little bit of background about myself. As was shared a little bit earlier, I've been working at ASD since 2003 and I've been the executive director for the past eight years. Now I was born deaf. I have deaf parents, deaf grandparents and deaf great grandparents. So I am fourth generation deaf. That is extremely unusual. About 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents and hearing families. We do have a few that have several generations of deaf in the family, but it's very rare. I was born up in Kingston, New York, and 
that particular town, the closest deaf school was quite a ways away. So my parents made the decision after they found the Lexington School for the Deaf in Queens, New York, to bring me back and forth. They made the two hour trek each way to ensure that I would be able to receive my education. After several years, they realized it was just much too far. And so we moved closer to Lexington and I grew up at that deaf school for several years. Eventually I left and went on to go to Gallia at University in Washington, D.C., and then McDaniel College in Maryland for my master's in deaf education. Afterwards, I returned to, I returned to Lexington School for the Deaf as a history and social studies teacher, which I very much enjoyed, and then I moved up the ranks to become the development director. Now, we had the first deaf superintendent at American School for the Deaf back in 2003, Dr. Harvey Corson. He recruited me to come to Connecticut. Now, I never thought I would leave New York, but he convinced me. And so I moved to Connecticut and I absolutely love it. I have been here ever since. And it is wonderful to be able to work for such a historical school. The American School for the Deaf had three very important people whose lives intersected and resulted in the founding of our school. And I will be talking about each of these individuals throughout my presentation. The first one is Mason Fitch Cogswell. He was a physician and the father of a deaf child named Alice. The second individual is Top Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. He was a minister and he at that time had no church, which I thought was a very interesting fact when he was working. Laurent Claire was a teacher, not here in America. He was actually a teacher in France. And essentially we stole him from France and convinced him to come here. Now back in the 1900s, it was very interesting. They had the second great awakening and that really was a time of tremendous change in America. People started to have open discussions, intellectual conversations about a variety of topics such as religion, things happening across our nation that also caused people to become more charitable and more generous in their giving. They became very involved with various groups and societies. And so there was quite a bit of reform happening during this time. Also, there were many new societies. We have almshouses and orphanages that were founded, and that also included schools for the deaf that were starting to be founded during this great awakening period. Now, history often points out to one of the greatest examples of generosity and giving during this great awakening is with the American School for the Deaf. And I'll talk about that just a little bit more, but to be honest, people realized that we needed to educate deaf children. And so several individuals came together and donated money to send Thomas Gallaudet to France to be able to bring back education. And they continued to invest by building our school and allowing us to move forward. So we are very thankful to the founding fathers and for all of the things that happened during that great awakening period that led to the founding of the American School for the Deaf. Now, the story about Alice Cogswell is she was a young deaf girl, and it was a very interesting story. To this day, there are still no pictures of Alice Cogswell other than the statue that we have pictured here. But anyway, so Alice was two years old when she lost her hearing. Her father was a physician. And her father wondered what he was going to do about this. So he decided to take the initiative and search out how he would educate his daughter. He was very fortunate that his neighbor was Thomas Gallaudet. Now, Thomas Gallaudet, as I shared earlier, was a minister and took some time to talk to uh, Dr. Cogswell and felt that Alice was capable of learning. And really, Alice is our icon. We look up to her greatly because she proved that a deaf child, a child with hearing loss could absolutely be taught. Now, as I shared, Thomas Gallaudet was Dr. Codswell's neighbor. 
And the story behind this is that Thomas Gallaudet happened upon Alice Cogswell. And when he met her, he had a top hat that he was wearing. Alice really was fascinated with the top hat. So Thomas took off his hat and proceeded to write the letters H-A-T in the sand next to Alice. Alice looked at the letters in the sand, looked at Thomas's hat and made that connection. It was in that very moment that Thomas Gallaudet realized that if Alice could make that connection, then other children with a hearing loss would also be capable of education and making those connections. So Dr. Cogswell said, we've absolutely got to do something. Back in those days here in America, we did not have any schools for the deaf other than one small school in Virginia called the Braidwood Academy. Their focus was on oral methods of education, but it was not a well-known school. And so there was a desire to explore these opportunities and people directed Thomas Gallaudet to Europe because there was a rich history in Europe. There were different deaf schools with different kinds of methodology for educating deaf children. So Dr. Cogswell said, we absolutely have to send somebody out there. And so he was able to convince Thomas Gallaudet to take the trip out to Europe. They came together initially to decide how they would fund Thomas's trip. And the people that came together are called the 10 founders. So when you see Alice Cogswell and she is surrounded in her statue with two hands and 10 fingers, those 10 fingers represent one, each one of the founding fathers. And these founding fathers were vital people. They were people of wealth and prominence in Connecticut. And when they came together, they agreed that they needed to help set up a school for deaf children. So they started the process by sending Thomas Gallaudet on a boat over to Europe. Thomas Gallaudet stayed in Europe for a total of 13 months, but he was not able to find exactly what he wanted to educate deaf children. Now, some schools did not even let Thomas in to understand what their methodology and their education methods were, but it just so happened that he saw there was an advertisement for Abbe Sicard who was presenting, he was actually a uh, director of the Royal Institute for Deaf Mutes. And so Thomas Gallaudet saw this flyer for a presentation and decided to attend. Thomas was impressed because Sicard talked about all of the education that was happening, the success they were having with deaf students. So right after the presentation, Thomas immediately approached him and said, I want to learn more. So Sicard said, absolutely, and invited Thomas to visit his school in Paris, France. Now that deaf school had been in existence for many years and actually I myself had an opportunity to go visit several years ago. It is amazing. They still have their old campus with their old buildings and many wonderful old paintings. So there's such a rich history there. If any of you travel to France, I would recommend that you stop by that school to have a tour. They do welcome visitors and offer tours. It is an absolutely fascinating place. So Thomas arrived in Paris and met Lorraine Claire. Now Lorraine Claire was a 30 year old educator who was also deaf himself. Thomas Gallaudet was absolutely taken with Lorraine Claire. Lorraine was brilliant. He could sign, he could write, he had amazing language. He was an absolute role model. And Thomas was determined to bring him back to America. Now, of course, Lorraine Claire thought for me to go to America? He said, absolutely not. He told Thomas, my roots are here, my students, my work. But after much discussion, Thomas Gallaudet convinced Lorraine Claire to come to America. And I believe it was a three-year agreement. So they moved forward with that. And the two of them sailed back across the ocean to America. It was a 66 day journey. And during that journey, the story is that Gallaudet took the opportunity to teach Lorraine Claire English because he was fluent in French, not English. During that time, Lorraine Claire also taught Thomas Gallaudet French sign language. So after 66 days, they finally arrived here in America. That partnership led to the opening of the American School for the Deaf in 1817. 
The first school was located in a hotel room. It was a one room space. Eventually it went to a house and then moved to Hartford. And that site is currently where the Hartford Insurance Company is located on Asylum Street. That is the third location of the third campus for the American School for the Deaf. Years later, the campus moved and relocated to West Hartford. And the reason for that move was because of expansion and the fact that the school needed more space. And so that was the reason for several locations. But ever since then, we continue to be here in West Hartford. And I'll talk about our school in just a little bit. Now, Lorraine Clare went right in and dove into teaching deaf students, and he brought his methods that he had implemented in France here in America and truly changed the lives of deaf children and let them know that they could absolutely be whatever they wanted to be. Now, Thomas Gallaudet and Lorraine Clare truly transformed lives across Connecticut for deaf people. Now, you would think, you know, perhaps in that time, you would have schools for students ages birth to 21, but back in those days, they even had students that were as old as uh, in their 50s. It didn't matter. They opened up their doors to anybody that was deaf and looking for an education. Now, of course, that has changed due to laws, and so the age range is birth to 21. Now, because it was the very first school for the deaf, they were developing what now is known as deaf education. They developed the first curriculum, the first teaching methodologies that were implemented here. Now, ASD also had many wonderful teachers that were willing to learn sign language, that really were inspired to help educate deaf children and see them grow and thrive. Additionally, the school trained their students to later go on and become educators at other deaf schools across the country. So ASD not only taught their own students, they also helped these students grow and thrive and go on to lead other schools across the country. Now we're going to talk about the connection with stores. There were two former students that graduated. We have Sarah Williams Stores. She taught at ASD from 1855 to 1871, so almost 20 years. And also there was her brother, Richard Salter Stores. And he also taught from 1853 to 1884. Oh my goodness, that is 31 years. That's amazing. Now, both of them were true role models of what ASD had to offer the very best opportunities. They were amazing. And the methodologies that they implemented are even being used still today. And I'll give you a couple examples of what that looks like. Now, the store's academic approach really emphasized the use of visual aids. That meant showing pictures, writing information to bring knowledge and education to students. Because students didn't have any hearing, they understood that deaf students relied on their eyes to be able to receive information. So being able to explain concepts in a visual way really started with the store's siblings. And so that really did foster the beginning of deaf education. They continued to change and adjust all of their teaching methods as the years went on. And as you look through history, you can see all of the different methodologies that they implemented. They really did understand not only how to teach students, but how students learn best. It was very impressive. They both also believe that students could be independent, that deaf students could go on to become whoever they wanted to be, and they themselves were living proof. They were former students that went on to become educators, so true role models. And they believed that language was living. It was not something that was static. It was something that could grow. And as people learned, language would absolutely grow with their knowledge. It was also very inspiring. They helped students be inspired with hope, courage, and knowledge. And that connects to a framework that we implement at our school today, PBIS, Positive Behaviors, Interventions, and Supports. The principle of that program is to be responsible, be respectful, and be safe. But that concept 
of PDIS is something we implement today. And it's something that was started at our school a few years ago. But if you look back across our history, it is exactly what the store's siblings implemented at ASD. Their philosophy, their thought process is really not any different than what we have today. They always encourage the positive attitudes and behaviors. Truly amazing to see. Now, both of the siblings used scrolls, and we actually have some of those scrolls in our Cogswell Heritage House. So if you have an opportunity to come visit our campus, Jean will be more than happy to show you those scrolls. And when you see those visual images, you will be in awe. It is beautiful. It's on this delicate paper, and the pictures are gorgeous. We were able to put these on display at the Connecticut Historical Society when we had a display lay there during our bicentennial celebration several years ago. But these scrolls are very, very old. As we look today at education, things are so different with technology. We went from scrolls to blackboards to smart boards. And just prior to the end of our school year this year, I went into a classroom and there was a TV screen. It was a touch screen that a teacher was using to educate the students. So you think about that. We went from years and years and years ago to drawing pictures on scrolls to touch screen boards in classrooms. And so we can see how history and the evolution of technology has had a tremendous impact on deaf students and education. Now, I'd also like to talk about emergency communication. In the event there's an emergency, such as a fire on campus or a lockdown, there are automatic notifications that now go to our classrooms. We have TV screens in each classroom that offer emergency announcements in American Sign Language, as well as with captioning and an audio component too, to alert students and staff that there is a lockdown or a fire that is happening on campus. And so all of the technology advancements that we're seeing are truly impacting deaf children, deaf staff lives in wonderful ways. Now, as we look at deaf education, over the years, it has changed. Currently at the American School for the Deaf, we have something called professional learning communities. Our counselors, our teachers, our occupational therapists, um, physical therapists constantly work and talk about how we can continue to change and improve how we educate and work with our deaf students. Now this year we had the pandemic and many people may wanna know how we were able to operate through the pandemic. And I have to share that we never closed our doors throughout the entire pandemic. And the reason for that is because within the American School for the Deaf, we have two programs. We have our academic program. We also have a residential treatment program. Now that residential treatment program is open 365 days a year, 24 seven. So we never closed our doors because we have students on campus in that residential treatment program. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had our students on campus and others that went home. And so we did have remote opportunities for those students so they could continue to receive an education. But when school opened this fall, we made sure that we opened our doors for both the residential treatment program, which had been open all along, as well as for our academic program. Now, the reason why I was very, very intent on making sure we opened our doors in the fall is because we have three important things that we're able to provide to our students. Now, deaf students, as I shared earlier, are typically born to hearing parents, and sometimes those parents are not fluent in American Sign Language, and so we want to be able to provide that communication access. Sometimes we're able to provide opportunities for parents when they're able to do so to join sign language classes so we can teach them sign language, but really when they come to our our school, they have full communication access, and that is really vital to their education and their development. We also saw a tremendous impact from the pandemic on mental health of deaf students. And so when they were able to be on campus with us, we were able to support their mental health needs. A third component that was really important for us and the reason why we kept our school open all throughout the pandemic is because our students have nutritional needs. Now for many students that worked or go to school in their local school districts, they were able to receive meals and nutritional needs were met through their school districts. At the American School for the Deaf, we are unique because we have students not just from Connecticut, but from all over the country, 
from Wyoming, Texas, Vermont. And so this school is a place where they're able to receive their nutritional needs that is all able to be met here. And so I'm extremely proud of the staff and the people who were dedicated and came to work each and every day throughout the pandemic to keep our school open. Some people ask about the curriculum and what kind of education we provide at the American School for the Deaf. We follow the common core standards that all schools use. Now our students, we do absolutely adjust um, our core curriculum because every student that comes to our school has an individualized education plan and so we are able to adjust and meet every student's individual needs. We do foster critical thinking and learning so that we have the students be engaged so that they can really thrive. It's not just teachers presenting, students are very much a part of their learning process. Now to talk about language and American Sign Language, as you see me here signing to all of you, I'm using American Sign Language, ASL. Now some people ask if ASL is an actual formal language, and I am here to tell you that it is absolutely a full formal visual language. It has its own grammar and syntax, and it is not exactly like English. It is something totally different, just like Spanish and English have their, each their own syntax and grammar structure. So I'm going to talk also more about the bilingual approach that we use here. With spoken language, if you live in New England, there's one kind of accent that people tend to have. If you live down south, there's a different kind of accent people tend to have. The same is true for sign language. If you live up north, people tend to sign one way. If people live down south, there are several variations on different signs. Now, some ask me about international sign language, if it is the same as what we use here in America. And the answer is no. Every country has their own sign language. When you go to Spain, they have Spanish sign language. France has their own sign language, but what's really interesting is that if you are hearing, and say you travel to Pakistan, for example, if you try to speak to individuals in Pakistan, you may face some serious communication barriers. But because sign language has some variations, we are able to much easier, have an easier time connecting with individuals as we go to different countries because of the sign language, we're able to really adapt and adjust. And I think it's one of the advantages of being deaf and using sign language. Now, as I shared earlier, I talked about the store's siblings and the philosophy that they implemented in their educational methodologies and approach about hope and strength and resilience and how that really does align with our PDIS framework today of being responsible, respectful, and safe. And that history is absolutely fascinating. And I'm so proud that we have that connection. Now, Sarah Stores, as you look into the history, she was such a friendly person. She had a wonderful positive attitude and absolutely had a passion for our students. She had a published news article in 1817 that talked about the fact that deaf people absolutely are like the sun and they can radiate and thrive. Now we had a location for our school on Asylum Avenue that was previously called the Asylum for the Deaf. And I'm not crazy about that terminology, but that was accepted back then. But that place, that school was where students that were deaf were able to get language access and communication. They were in an environment where people cared about them, who were passionate about making sure they received an education and that they thrived. And so the frameworks that we use today are very similar. Our philosophies are not any different than what they were back then. We don't look to use punitive methods. We use positive approaches with our students to help instill a passion for lifelong learning in each of our deaf students. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about ASD history. ASD is famous for many firsts. Now people may not realize that we are the first permanent school for the deaf in America, but we are also the first special education facility in the Western hemisphere. In those days, there was no other special education school in the country, nothing for 
students with learning disabilities or students who have autism, we were the very first. And then after us, other schools were founded. We were also the first school to get both state and federal funding to be able to open our doors. Today, ASD only receives state appropriations funding. We don't receive any federal funds with the exception of grants. Currently with COVID-19, we, we were very fortunate that we were also able to get some federal support to help us through the pandemic. We also make sure that deaf students go on to find jobs after they graduate. And many of our students have gone on to teach in other deaf schools. Back in our initial years, I believe there were about 20 deaf schools that were founded and they were set up by students that graduated from the American School for the Deaf. The very first African American student who was deaf came through our doors in 1825. During that time, there was segregation and no other African American deaf students would be accepted at any other deaf school, but we accepted them here at the American School for the Deaf. Also, the first deaf blind school came to ASD in 1825. We also were the first vocational education program for deaf students. And in those days, we taught shoemaking, sewing, cooking, and all of those kinds of vocational skills were what we offered our students back then. Today, it looks very different. We have video production, web design. We still have culinary arts. We have horticulture. We have a variety of opportunities that we're able to provide our students with. Another first that's very interesting is that 1819, we enrolled the first out-of-state student from Massachusetts. Now that student came from Massachusetts and then over the years, it has grown to over 2000 Massachusetts students that attended ASD and we still continue to have students from Massachusetts. Eventually Massachusetts did establish their own deaf school and they have it in Eastern Bo um, Massachusetts near Boston, but out in Western Massachusetts, they have one smaller day school, but no other deaf school. So oftentimes we see students from Cape Cod or Western Massachusetts that come to our school. Also previously, we had Lorraine Claire and Thomas Gallaudet that presented nationally about deaf education. And so people realized they needed to support money, they needed to provide money to support our school so that we could continue to educate deaf children. The goal ultimately, as I said before, was to encourage deaf students to become independent and productive members of society as carpenters, farmers, cabinet makers, bookmakers, dressmakers. You'll notice that most of these skills are hands-on kind of skill sets. And so deaf people were very much known for their expertise with using their hands. And so we saw large numbers of deaf people working in print shops and for example, and one reason for that was because of all of the noise, it was very difficult for hearing people to work in those printing press shops. And so printing press shops were a site for many deaf employees because they didn't mind the noise since they couldn't hear it. Now going back to American Sign Language and how the language first started. So we had Laurent Claire that came to France and when he came, he brought French Sign Language, LSF. Now many deaf students that lived here in Connecticut used home signs. They created their own signs and gestures as a means to be able to communicate with their families. And we also had another community in Martha's Vineyard. And so on that island, they had a large deaf community. And some believe the reason for that was because there were many um, intermarriages among families. And that was the reason for the large number of deaf children. But now within Martha's Vineyard, everybody signed, regardless if you were deaf or hearing, it was just part of their daily life. And there's wonderful books that talk about that experience of being in the deaf community in Martha's Vineyard. But anyway, when American School for the Deaf initially opened, many students came from Martha's Vineyard with their own signs. We had students locally from Connecticut that came with their home signs. And then we had Laurent Claire that brought French Sign Language. All of that merged together to become American Sign Language as we know it today. Now, American Sign Language is a constantly evolving language. Just like within spoken English, we have new slang, new words every year that come up. The same is true for American Sign Language. There's constant changes to sign 
signs and new words that are added to the language every year. Now our commitment all along has always been to our students. I will do whatever it takes to make sure our students receive an education regardless of their abilities. We have some deaf students that have other disabilities, but we work to meet their needs and we're able to do so through a bilingual program. Now, some of you might be wondering, what is a bilingual program, American Sign Language and English? Well, American Sign Language is a visual language. English can be a spoken language. It can be something you acquire through listening or reading or writing. Now, previously what we did is mixed both languages. And so we would have people sign and talk at the same time. That was known as a total communication method. However, research found that students would oftentimes become confused between the two languages and they had a hard time acquiring two languages. And I would compare that to being able to try to acquire French and English at the same time. How would that work? If you can speak both French and English at the same time, I'm really impressed. But that was the whole reason why in American School for the Deaf, we decided to separate the languages, American Sign Language and English, but show the connections. So we are able to provide instruction, for example, in American American Sign Language, but also reinforce the English component through writing on the board or providing reading for our students and literacy support so that they're able to acquire strong foundations in both language, languages. Now, I've already pretty much covered this, but the bilingual approach is the concept of separating American Sign Language and English and helping students to understand that they are two completely separate languages, but being sure that we expose them to both. Now, today at the American School for the Deaf, we have some fabulous programs. We have a birth to three program that is under the state of Connecticut, where all children who have any kind of hearing loss, if they need supports, we have three centers in Connecticut and ASD is one of the three centers where parents are able to send their children so that we can provide support for children and parents alike to make sure they get the right kind of services, audiological testing, and so that those families families and their children are able to get the right kind of language foundation so that they enter kindergarten school ready. We also have our pre-K through 12 academic program, just like any other public school would. We offer all of the core subjects. We also have another program called our Residential Treatment Program, and that acronym is PACES. It stands for Positive Attitudes Concerning Education and Socialization. PACES program. That is a 24-7, 365-day-a-year residential treatment program and is also a part of our school community. Three years ago, we expanded that program to include students who have autism. Now, some of you might be wondering why we accept students with autism. And the reason for that is because research found that many autistic students can hear and some are able to express themselves through verbal means or written means, but others are nonverbal. And so they have no way of expressing their wants or needs, or they're not able to accept auditory messages. And so research was finding that sign actually works well with some hearing nonverbal autistic students. And so we offer that as a methodology for teaching those students. And I've got a story about three years ago when we initially opened that program, a student came to our door through our doors who was 12 years old, had no language, couldn't understand what was happening in the environment around them. And that student's parents were very frustrated. Within that student's first year at the American School for the Deaf, that student acquired 25 new signs. And now that student currently knows over a hundred signs, is able to tell the parents, I'm hungry or I need to go to the bathroom. And so we are very, very proud of that success for that student. And we are continuing to expand that program. As I shared earlier, we have students that come to our campus from all over. And so we also have dorms on campus and we have staff that can both sign and or speak. And so our students have full communication access. We also offer a variety of sports, you name it, we have it, volleyball, soccer, track. We also have a beautiful summer camp called Isla Bella and that's located in Salisbury, Connecticut in the Northwest corner of our state. We are very fortunate that it was donated to our school by a former board member. And so each summer we run a summer camp for deaf and hard of hearing students, not only from Connecticut, but from all over our country and the world. 
We continue our training and vocational programs so we can ensure that we prepare our students for the world of work. Now, many of our students are able to go on to college programs, but we have other students who are not college bound and that truly really doesn't meet their needs. And so we are able to offer them a vocational track and we offer all different kinds of opportunities for each of our students. Technology has truly transformed the lives of deaf individuals over the years. New hearing aids, we used to have analog hearing aids, and now with the advent of digital hearing aids, we have cochlear implants. All of that technology has helped many students. But some ask, if somebody has a cochlear implant, doesn't that mean they can hear everything they need? So why do we need deaf schools? Why do they need to sign? What I wanna share is that when people have cochlear implants, they don't hear perfectly at the onset. They do require a lot of training and some children may not benefit. Some children that are deaf or hard of hearing that get the cochlear implant do thrive and do just fine. Others do not and thrive using American in sign language. I myself, an example, I had a hearing aid and I used that for several years. And when I realized my freshman year of high school that it really didn't benefit me, then I stopped using it and I just uh, fell back on American Sign Language. Sometimes when I go to the movies, I would use a hearing aid, but that was just really to help identify sound. But really I do rely on American Sign Language. So it's oftentimes the misconception that if one person succeeds or does well with a certain assistive device, that everybody will do well. And that is just not the case. Everybody is individual in their needs and abilities and hearing and how the assistive technology is able to help them. Now, social media is another platform and sometimes misinformation can be shared. And so we wanna make sure that information is accurate. There's also other kinds of technology such as video phones, iPhones. I could use a video phone application through my iPhone and sign directly to the person on their phone that has the same app. We're able to sign back and forth. Technology really has transformed our lives and we're able to do anything. Another example is email. If I was to email you, you would not know that I was deaf because I'm able to type those emails in English just like you are. At that point, we're on equal footing. So technology is wonderful. Smart boards, captioning. It's wonderful to see that online, everything is captioned. And so we have equal access to information. Now, captioning is wonderful, but I do want to say that for students to be able to benefit from captioning and read it, they must have strong English Skills. So it's important that we give them that strong language foundation in an American Sign Language and English. Now, our school building currently is one of the most advanced in terms of technology of any school across the country. Students that come in with cochlear implants have the ability to connect immediately with a Phonax system that is available in every single classroom. And so it connects to the teacher and it helps eliminate any background noise. So we put that system into place to help the students that are working on their listening abilities. We also, as I shared earlier, have amazing technology and systems to alert students and staff of emergencies if they happen on campus. And we have also wonderful laptop devices and and computers, so we have full access to that information. On campus, students have opportunities to have full access to communication, sports opportunities, field trips. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about our Camp Isabella, and here you can see all of the pictures of these smiling students having an amazing time at our summer camp. So that is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy at this time to take any questions and share that with my wonderful partner in crime, Jean Linderman. She is really very knowledgeable, so if you have any questions about the school in general, I'm happy to answer those questions or history, any kind of historical questions, Jean may be able to address those. I'm gonna stop my screen share so that you can see that, and I'm gonna monitor the chat. Okay, so interested to know, I see in the chat there's a question. I'm interested to know two things. So the American School for the Deaf 
is it grades one through 12, we actually provide opportunities for preschool, meaning after a child finishes the birth to three program, they're able to go right into preschool and stay with us all the way until 12th grade. We also have something that's called a transition program that is for students who have already graduated, but not may not be ready for going out into the world or college, we have a special program called the Bridges Program that allows our students to take some community college courses with the support of our staff or start to take advantage of some work opportunities. And we have job coaches that are able to accompany them so that they're able to make that transition to real world life. Currently at ASD, we have 145 students on campus. Almost 40 of the students are PACI students. That's our residential treatment program. And we also serve 200 other students throughout the state of Connecticut through our outreach program. That is through audiological supports, classroom supports, a variety of methods that we reach out to those students. So our students come from all over. Now, prior to COVID, we had several international students, but because of COVID-19, they had to stay in their countries. However, we had two students that did continue to stay with us in our dorms that were from another country. This coming fall, we have several international students that will be returning to our school. We will also be opening up a online academy for students that are not able to come to campus, but may benefit from an education with deaf individuals and receiving that education through American Sign Language. I see, oh, somebody lost power and they were able to join back in. I have to say so far, my power has been on. I was a little concerned because just prior to the meeting, I know thunderstorms were gonna be rolling through our area, but I am relieved that everything is okay. Okay, so that's all I see in the chat box. Are there any other questions that you'd like to ask? Jean and I are here to answer. Heidi, we have a question in the chat that says, can you speak to the 19th century controversy about sign language communication versus spoken communication? Sure, absolutely. So that happened during the Milan conference in Italy. And really, it goes back to the founding of our school. When we started our school, we started it with American Sign Language because Loren Claire believed that sign language was the proven methodology to educate deaf children, and it had been proven to be successful in deaf students. So we started with that methodology. Now, during the 1870s, there was quite a bit of push from A.G. Bell, from their organization, their people, from the folks that worked at Braidwood who believed in oral methodologies. They believed that was the way for deaf children to learn so that they could thrive and function in life. Now that push became a powerful movement and it resulted in a Milan conference in Italy. It was called the International Conference on the Education of the Deaf. It had a little bit of a different name, but today that conference still happens every five years. In fact, it just was held previously in Australia, but anyway. So during that conference in Milan, there was a lot of people in attendance and after much discussion, they decided to make the announcement that sign language is not effective and that the oral approach to educating deaf children was the way to go. So after that conference, at that point, oralism was prevalent in America and many schools adopted that as their means of educating students or they went to total communication, meaning they did both sign and speak at the same time to meet the needs of all the students. Now it's interesting, even though the oralism movement was prevalent in the country, the American School for the Deaf never changed. We did move to total communication for a period of time and then back to American Sign Language. When I became executive director, I wanted to go back to our roots to where Laurent Claire founded the school, where we had a bilingual approach. We absolutely offer the listening and spoken English approach for the students that benefit from that methodology, but we also have American Sign Language. Now, after some research, there was about 120 people that we found had attended the Milan conference, but they were all hearing. There was one deaf individual who attended that conference. And so looking back at history, why did people listen to all the hearing individuals that attended instead of asking the one deaf person what would be best? 
but I say history has its reasons and history tends to be very cyclical. It has the pendulum swing where we tend to go from one extreme to another. Hopefully we are swinging now in the right direction as we move forward. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we have another question. Does or did ASD have any relationship with the Clark School for the Deaf? So Jean, would you like to speak to that? No, we have a, a lot of students that um, in the admissions records, it's noticed, noted that we received them from the Clark School. So again, that's, um, you know, in this controversy that Jeff, Jeff was talking about, um, oral versus manual um, occurred, uh, we got an awful lot of kids from oral schools. And um, be, it might have been, it, I think it was an easier decision for par hearing parents to make because they could maybe easy, more easily incorporate the child into the family unit. But it was harder for the student to learn. Um, they just learned better. The ones we received learned better with the sign language method. So uh, the connection, the only connection that we have with the Clark School is the number of students we received from there. And there are quite a few. It's just a, it's a different teaching philosophy. Thank you, Jean. Um, another question here, what are your funding sources and do you charge tuition? Great question. So our funding is very different from what it was in 1817. The only thing that has remained the same is that the state of Connecticut, Connecticut has appropriations funds that they dedicate to our school. Now that appropriation fund is set aside to make sure that all deaf and hard of hearing children in Connecticut receive an education at our school if they'd like to. The towns do pay a smaller tuition for their students to attend our school. Most of that decision is made by the school district. In terms of the range of tuition costs, it does vary. So for example, a student who is a regular academic student who doesn't need any other kinds of supports or services comes right into the school. Now a student that may need additional supports such as a teacher's aid, we offer a different tuition scale for that. Or if there's a student that needs further supports such as 24 seven nursing and care, that would be a different tuition cost for that kind of support. But that is all determined by by the IEP Individual Education Plan meeting. The education team comes together to determine what the child's needs are and then the costs follow from there. So really the parents do not pay anything themselves for their child to attend our school. The school districts take care of that. For international students, that's a little bit different. Internationally, it could be the government that pays for their time at ASD or sometimes families private pay. So we have varying tuition rate, uh, ranges. Thank you, Jeff. Um, a couple more questions. Um, does ASD teach other languages such as French Sign Language? Yes, absolutely. So over the years, we have um, offer different foreign language opportunities depending on the students and what they would like. We've done Spanish, we've done French, but one thing that we have um, offered for several years is French Sign Language, and that is because of our connection with France. Pre-COVID, again, this is pre-COVID times, every year our students would learn French and then go have an opportunity to visit our sister school in Paris, France. And so they would take a two week visit. They would have one week where they would be engaged in the school and then another week where they would have an opportunity to stay with a host family. And then the next year, the French deaf students would learn English and come to our school for two weeks. And so they'd stay and take classes at our school for a week. And then a second week, they would be a host with a host family and have opportunities to visit different national sites across our country, such as Washington DC or New York. So we've, we've kept that close relationship more with France than any other country, but that's a strong bond we've had over the years. 
Do you have any students who have gone to NTID from ASD? NTID is awesome. Oh yes, absolutely. We have had many. We have several deaf programs available to students across the country. We have NTID, that's the National Technical Institute of the Deaf, and that is under the Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. We also have Gallaudet at University in Washington, DC, and we have CSUN, that is the California State University Northridge School. Those are the three well-known deaf programs available for deaf individuals. Now, ASD, for some reason, many of our students go on to attend uh, school at NTID. We have several that go on to Gallaudet University, but we have many that go to NTID. Just two weeks ago, we had our own graduation ceremony. It was wonderful. And from that graduating class, we have five students that will be going to NTID. It was a wonderful group of students that graduated. We had 16 in total. Some are going on to group homes, some are going to community colleges, but five out of the 16 are going to NTID. And I'm looking here in the chat box, I see a question about, can you give us an example of a sign that is different in English versus French? Okay, so I'm trying to think now. Um, oh, um, this, this is a French sign. That's wait, wait in French. In American Sign Language, this is the sign. You can see it's just a slight difference, but it's the hand shape and palm orientation that's a little bit different between the two languages. That's one example. Um, so here we sign watch. And there in French sign language, that's the sign for watch. So there are a little bit of similarities between the two sign languages. They say about 40% of American sign language is clearly connected to French Sign Language. The other 60% is what Americans have developed and evolved with. So now with the new generation of students, I have to say that they are heavily involved in technology. And so they are constantly creating new signs. And I very much enjoy learning those new signs every single day from our younger uh, students. But I also love our old signs, the signs that my grandparents taught to me, but they are very different than what I see in today's younger generations. But that is how life goes on and the language continues to evolve. Um, a couple questions about lip reading. What, what about the role of lip reading? And can you teach us how to say thank you? Okay, so I absolutely will teach you. Um, for lip reading, absolutely. It does depend again on the student. If the student, I wanna come back and emphasize this point once again, if the student doesn't have language, can they learn to read or write? Absolutely not. Could they learn how to listen or speak if they don't have a language foundation? Absolutely not. So if the student doesn't have a language foundation, can they learn to lip read? No, it really depends on every individual child and their development. I have to say for I for myself, I'm a pretty good lip reader because I have such a strong language foundation. I'm able to be pretty successful, but I've got to warn you, if you have a beard and a mustache, a lot of facial hair, I will tell you upfront, forget it. I just cannot do it. I will not be able to lip read you. And some people move their mouth in such a tiny way that it's hard for me to distinguish what they are saying. Other people are much more clear in their enunciation. I also get the question, if one person can lip read, does that mean every deaf person can lip read? That is not the case. It really is varied and it's a very individual thing. Some people don't mind lip reading. Some people have some residual hearing to support the lip reading. Other people just want to write back and forth. Others still just want to bring an interpreter into a communication situation. It really varies for every individual. My advice is when you meet a deaf person, ask them. Ask them how they'd like to communicate. All right, now let me go back to your next question. This is a sign for thank you. It's very simple. Thank you it is your palm with your fingers on your chin moving out. Um, someone said, I want to ask Jean to tell you what some of her favorite items in the ASD Museum collection are. Oh boy, what a loaded question. 
um, Jeff talked earlier about our scrolls. Those are um, those are wonderful items that we have. Early teaching aids, and in fact, the things that actually the stores used themselves, um, inkwells, uh, the teaching aids, uh, and we have a lovely collection of um, Lauren Claire's uh, personal items on permanent loan to us from his family. And um, uh, those are remarkable items. We've just added some wonderful items to our collection this year, thanks to Jeff, of early um, 1800s pieces of Staffordshire, which depict the school. Jeff spoke about the second great awakening. And the reason these pieces are so valuable to us is they picture uh, the old asylum, our old school on these pieces. And the reason that the school was um, featured in this American series of Staffordshire, China was because the school was considered such an important part of the second great awakening. Not many institutions have lasted, well, we just celebrated our 200th anniversary a few years ago. Not many institutions that were developed at that time still continue, not just continue, but thrive. So those pieces with those early images are important. Our early artwork is important from uh, painters and silversmiths and miniatures, woodworkers, our, the, some of the furniture in our museum is made by our students toys, games that were made by our own students, and we have a wonderful provenance on them. Um, our um, documents, our original certificate of incorporation, and um, letters, personal letters from uh, Laurent Claire and Thomas Gallaudet to each other, to their families, uh, children's letters home, telling them about what life was like living at the school. These are wonderful insights into our history. I, I don't think, it's like asking a mom to pick her favorite kid. My mom had 10 of them. And so we always used to ask her who was her favorite. You can't do it. <laughs> Honestly, I have to say I've traveled to many deaf schools and I've never seen anyone that has such a rich collection, just like we do. We even have Sarah Fowler's Gallaudet's wedding dress. We have Thomas Gallaudet's glasses. I have to say it is amazing. We have so many remarkable, valuable things in our um, collection. Also, I see another good question. Did Lauren Claire ever return back to France? And I share the same story. We had Laurent Claire on loan to us for three years. And after that time, he made the decision to stay in America. He did go on to other uh, states to help develop their deaf schools, such as Pennsylvania, for example. But then he always returned back to the American School for the Deaf. It was like his home base. And he ended up living the rest of his life here in Hartford and passed away here in Hartford. And I often tell people that when I moved from New York to Connecticut, I said, I'm only doing this for a year or two because I am a true New Yorker. But now I've been here 18 years. I probably will stay and die here. I don't know. We'll see. Time will tell. I know that we went a little bit over in terms of time, but if there are no other questions, I want to share. The American have, the one is always open. I know that with COVID-19, things are a little bit different. The world looks a little bit different, and we are very much in compliance with the state and their guidance around COVID-19 mitigation strategies. We are not open to the public and visitors just yet. But after August 12th, we do plan to open our campus. So please do feel free to reach out to either myself or Jean, and we'd be more than happy to arrange a tour of our school and an opportunity to visit our museum. Bob, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Oh, I did. This is uh, Dr. Bob Kirkwood. I'm chairman of the board at Willie Ross School for the Deaf. And I want to thank you for this very informative lecture. And I would like to come down and visit the school sometime.
You are more than welcome. I know Bert Carter from Willie Ross very well. Bert used to work here in Connecticut and then moved to Vermont and then made the move to Willie Ross. Both of us serve on CEASD, the Conference of Education and Administrators for Schools for the Deaf. So if you see Bert, please do send him my regards. I did. I notified him about this uh, talk, so I'm surprised he's not on here. <laughs> I know everybody is busy, I'm sure. And I think I have to say, people must be tired of Zoom. I think there's a little bit of Zoom fatigue at this point and that's okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Lots of messages in the chat um, saying thank you. So I would also like to say thank you on behalf of Stores Library to Jeff and Jean and to Heidi. Um, thank you for sharing your story and all your expertise. Um, it was really great. Thank you very much. And everybody continue to stay well, stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we will be back together in person. Thank you. And this is Jeff. I just want to also take this opportunity to thank the Stores Library for hosting us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>